Um, thank you for your interesting explanation. Now, I don't want to rain down on your parade, but I do want to ask you a question that you could consider tough enough to earn that book. So, <laughs> you build your analysis on the limited amount of resources and the truth that the rise of the exponential curve uh, comes about very quickly. But re regarding oil, for instance, haven't motors become more efficient? And regarding copper and other resources, wouldn't there be an enormous incentive in the market to go recycle? So my question is, don't you overlook the fact that the ultimate resource is the human mind? Ah, so this is this is interesting question because um, underneath it, where there's really an act of faith, which is the idea that if we're clever enough, what we're going to do is is get out from under this. And the answer is we could easily be clever enough. The perfect time to have been really clever and demonstrate we were super smart would have been 1970, roughly, um, because it takes an enormous amount of time and scale and cost are all big giant parameters that are involved in shifting. So here's an example. The fastest energy transition, so energy transition, I mean, we used to live on biomass. So we went from wood, and then humans went to coal, and then we went to oil. The fastest of those transitions was about 40 years. So moving from wind to coal, right, wind power. So, so people had all these, uh, you know, clipper ships and, and sailing vessels. And then the steamers came along, and they were way, way more effective and efficient. And still it took 40 or 50 years before the last clipper ship went away, and, and we were all running on steamers. Why was that? Because the embedded capital that was already there embodied in the clipper ships, we made, people made the very natural decision that what we were going to do was allow those, those capitals to completely depreciate before we moved on. So here we are, it's 2011, and if we wanted to right now, tonight, snap our fingers, we've got the perfect electric vehicle, only cars that can be sold starting tonight are electric vehicles, that's it. But we're going to allow you to have your existing car, which has a lot of embodied energy in it, die a natural death. How long is it before we've replaced half the vehicle fleet in the world? And the answer would be 10 years. Now, we actually can't produce that many cars at, at present, electric cars, and we don't even know if there's enough, enough lithium to create the batteries to do that. And so there's just this incredible embodied energy and time and cost involved in making an energy transition. That's part one. Part two is humans as a species have never had to go from a more, uh, a more concentrated energy source to a less concentrated energy source. Moving from wood to coal was moving up the curve to a much better, more concentrated energy source. And from coal to oil, same thing. To move from coal, and, uh, sorry, from coal and oil right now onto alternatives, solar, what have you, means we're going to be moving to a more diffuse energy system. The costs involved are staggeringly more involved than, than moving up the curve, moving down the curve. And we've never done it before. And if it takes four decades, where are we in this story? So my answer to you is, yes, we can be very clever, we can be very creative, but there are certain realities of things that we cannot do. And I believe, trust me, we're going to make very ingenious decisions, we're going to do some incredible things, but the mistake would be to think we're going to do that without having to make any changes to our lifestyles, we'll do it completely without disruptions, and we'll do that seamlessly by having the future look just like the present, only larger. So um, going on to that, is there anything on the energy cliff which is above 2 to 1 which can buy us 10 or 15 years of time until we invent fusion or another higher energy, um, energy source? Yeah, so what we're not facing is an energy crisis at present. Certain wind and solar technologies uh, have returns that are in the 10 or 20 to 1 range, but they give us electricity. Um, we have plenty of electricity at present. The story I'm telling is around a liquid fuels emergency uh, that, that's potentially brewing. And so, at present, there are not that many alternatives for liquid fuels that can really operate at scale. Biofuels turned out not to really work as well as, as expected or hoped. In many cases, their energy returns are poor. They have other environmental consequences that are sort of being revealed as we move to scale. Um, and so the idea here is that we do have to move. The, the huge en energy opportunity is to figure out how to move to electricity to transport things. That's going to be an enormous growth opportunity. The bridge fuel, I think, if we wanted to use it as such, would be natural gas at this stage. And there, again, we have an enormous story because we don't have that many cars or, or buses that can run on compressed natural gas. We do not have filling stations that the average person can use if they exist at all. We need new pipelines. There's an enormous story of investment there that will have to happen. That would be the bridge fuel. In the meantime, what we have to do is get a new story in mind, which is that our job is not to grow as fast as possible, meaning figure out how to put more resources through the economic engine as fast as possible. We'll have to shift our story to one of stewardship. 
which was implied in your question. We're going to use our remaining resources wisely to have the most disruption-free transition from point A to point B. And that's something we absolutely could do. But will we is another question. Um, yeah, hi. Uh, a very good presentation. And my fear is as well that uh, we might face this kind of future. Um, but uh, there are some people uh, who think um, that there are just some interests um, who uh, um, just, uh, the, the big oil companies just uh, don't want to sell the oil at a lower price and so that they uh, hold back some of the oil. So um, my, my question is, uh, do you think that uh, perhaps uh, the abiotic uh, um, oil theory from uh, the Russians invented in the, in the 50s, mm -hmm. that there might be possibly, uh, I hope that there is some way out and that it's really the story is that uh, the oil is held, uh, held back just to achieve higher prices, but the prices in real terms in gold are not higher uh, from oil uh, compared uh, to uh, 30 years ago. Right, so the question um, first, is there some sort of a, a conspiracy to hold oil production back? And the answer to that is no as far as I'm concerned. And here we can look at, most oil now is nationalized. Very, very little of it still exists with major corporations which could independently make that decision. So now we have to believe that Mexico is purposely throttling back its, its um, production from the Cantarell field and from um, its other fields. And Mexico derives 40% of its government revenues from the export um, skim that they take off of their oil. And they are collapsing at an incredible rate, and it's starting to create enormous difficulties uh, on the funding side for the whole Mexican government. So we have to believe the Mexican government has said, you know, what we're going to do is we're going to really like skate right up to the brink of disaster politically um, in order to hold oil back from the market because we think we can get a better price later. That, that, that's an unthinkable concept, I think, at, at the level we're talking about. Norway, a very different um, you know, political model than Mexico facing enormous collapses of 8, 9, even 11 percent per year, depending on which fields we're talking about. And so we would have to believe that of the 45 countries that are now producing less than they used to, uh, that they've all decided together um, to do that on purpose. And, and that just seems like an unthinkable concept to me, because it, it means that everybody has to be in on that story somehow. And there's so much self-interest in, in not being part of that story. There's so much self-interest to, if you've got it, pump it. Oil is over $100 a barrel on the world market today. It's an incredible price by historical standards. I have every confidence that those who have it and can pump are pumping pretty much as hard as they can. And so, you know, that's a story that, that I think is, is pretty much true. The abiotic theory, if, if I could just, last year I went to Midland, Texas, um, which is right in the Permian Basin uh, of, of Texas, and they've got the oil museum there, which is the Louvre of, of oil museums. I mean, it's gorgeous. And I wish I could take people there, because they have this full uh, mock-up, a room you walk into, which just has all the strata of all the rocks, and they show you where the oil-bearing layers are, and they've mapped it down to within the nearest 10,000 years in this band that stretches back 80 million years. And they show you that the conditions were right in this one band, for biotic oil, for, for, for biological oil to form. And for somebody who wants to believe this is not biological in origin, you have to explain how this sandwich of oil got there with no oil below and no oil above. It had to magically get into this one spot. And, and it, it's just very obvious from all sorts of compelling data that um, biologic oil is by far the most uh, common source of oil, even if there is some um, abiotic formations that, that do happen. And to that point, we have oil fields now that have, were sucked dry over 80, 90 years ago, and they've not refilled. So even if there is some magic filling mechanism, it's not relevant in the human time scale and, and in the time scale of the issues we're talking about. Uh, it might happen over millions of years, but we are facing a problem over the next 10 or 20 years. Um. One, one question over here. First of all, thank you for your, for your presentation. It was quite interesting. But uh, I, I had a question. Your, your view with uh, exponential growth of the population and a very a cliff on all the r natural resources, uh, haven't you been accused in the past to be a little Malthusian on, on your view on one side? Because if we consider that in the past there has always been a technological, a technological innovation that helped us out, I think everybody counts here on, on that happening in the future. And that's it. Right. So, so this, is, this is, I think, the fallacy of extrapolating recent into the future. 
So when Malthus penned his, his famous treatise in 1779 and got that out there, uh, the world was a very different place. Couple things. Um, first of all, he didn't have Google. Um, so he had access to relatively poor information. Second of all, coal hadn't even begun to be exploited yet, so he didn't understand that there was a huge energy revolution coming and an industrial revolution. And so here we are, we've moved from, from wood to coal, coal to oil. The answer is, what's next? Big, giant, floating question mark there. And it's an open question. We have a lot of very, very intelligent people, billions of them, looking at this, and nobody has an answer for that one yet, what that next energy source is that we're going to move to. And the other thing is that in my lifetime, world population has more than doubled. That didn't happen in Malthus's time. We live in extraordinary times, and it, it doesn't, you don't even have to crack the newspaper very far to see that we're experiencing all sorts of challenges, whether it's water tables or arable soil or uh, you know, mineral depletion. These stories are all right there. And so I, I do reject the idea that we can look back and say some guy in the late 1700s was wrong once. Therefore, everybody has to be wrong forevermore on this subject. It seems limited to me. And we have incredible amounts of data right now. And what I'd prefer to have, rather than um, a, an argument over, over whether it's possible to be wrong in the same way twice, I'd rather look at the data and say, what is this telling us? How many quadrillions of BTUs do we have? How many are we expecting? Is there a shortfall? And if there is a shortfall, how are we going to make that up with, with opportunities that are realistic, that we, that we know about? I don't have much interest in hearing about some guy in a lab made a beaker of something. Um, I'm interested in, you show me the plant that's operating 100,000 barrels per day at a commercial scale that makes sense, and I'm interested all of a sudden. And there's just an immense amount of data that we can scratch at, an immense amount of experience that says, here are some things that simply suggest what's going to happen is change is coming. And that's my key point. I'm not here predicting a mass die-off. I'm not here predicting catastrophe, and I'm not going to tell you when. I'm saying that the mistake would be thinking that the future is going to resemble what we just lived through. And it's a very easy mistake to make. And I might be completely wrong, but what I'd love to have is that data-rich argument and counterbalancing argument, even a debate that would say, here's some credible things that we can point to that suggest how your story might be wrong, um, rather than casting all the way back to the 1700s um, would be uh, my response to that. Okay, otra pregunta, ahí arriba. Hi. Could you share your personal forecast for oil in the coming years? My in price. Uh, in price. Um, I'm, I'm actually less price sensitive. So, so if I can hedge that and say in, in current dollar terms, because I have no idea what the value of the dollar is going to be going forward. So holding the dollar constant, which is a big if, um, my expectation would be that um, I am personally forecasting that we're going to have a supply and demand imbalance that will be completely obvious by the year 2013, give or take a year. And, and that's based on looking at uh, current consumption patterns, looking at the depletion rates for all the major fields, looking at the new things that are coming online, and making one more assumption that we don't have some giant global recession slash depression that knocks demand um, uh, for a loop. But assuming that you know, things limp along as they currently are, um, I'm looking for supply and demand to get seriously out of whack in the 2013 time frame. When that does, we will see uh, oil, I think, double in price pretty rapidly and then probably triple in price before it completely uh, you know, uh, hamstrings world growth again and, and we go through a sawtooth pattern of economic recovery and uh -oh, oil prices um, collapse it, recovery, oil prices collapse, sort of a sawtooth pattern as we go down is, is generally how I think this is going to work. And, um, what I'm looking for here is, is really around the idea that um, oil, the thing that we have to understand, so 86 million barrels per day is total liquids production in the world. It's not the important number. The important number is how many of those go on to the world export market. Because most oil actually gets produced and consumed in the, in the host countries. 35 million barrels is how many uh, barrels make it onto the world export market. If that, for whatever reason, suddenly goes to 34 instead of 35, that's when the trouble starts. And so when I say I'm looking for a supply-demand mismatch in 2013, that's right around the time I'm expecting peak oil to be publicly recognized, not by a, a bunch of engineers or, or within um, certain uh, oil majors or even with certain countries like Sweden has a whole plan for how they're going to get off of imported oil by 2020. So beyond, beyond those, those groups, I'm saying world recognition of peak oil will probably happen around 2013. And when that happens, I'm expecting at least one nation to nationalize their oil, maybe Norway. 
says, you know, instead of exporting 1.2 million barrels per day, we're going to keep that and we're actually going to um, bring that into our own country and save that for future generations. That's all it will take to seriously spike oil prices because oil prices are set at the margin. If we need 35 million barrels on the world export market and we have 34.9, we have a big problem. And that's when oil spikes right there and then. Um, you know, in 2008, when we had that oil price spike to 147 a barrel in July, that happened because for five out of the six quarters preceding that spike, world oil inventories were drawn down because we were consuming more than we were producing, even at the highest incentive ever to produce. And so that was my first wake-up call that said, that's what the dynamic is going to look like. It's going to look like 2008, only next time I think it'll be more dramatic, which is why I would forecast a doubling, that is going to at least $200 a barrel. Would we pay that? Sure. We pay a lot more than that. Oil is worth a lot more than 200 a barrel. It's worth more than 400 a barrel. We'll pay it.